Welcome back, and my guest is Dr. Vincent Mapai. We're discussing our democratic state, its capacity, and the question of freedoms within the South African context. And Dr. Mapai, as we continue, um, I would like you to give me the salient elements of our democracy in South Africa. Earlier, I did say, how do we compare to the rest of the world? And I'm asking this question for the benefit of our viewers and for my benefit as well, to say, where, what exactly should I look for to see whether this system is fit for purpose? Actually, our democracy is our strongest point. <laughs> I mean, the country is energetic. You listen to talk shows, whether it's Twitter, there's free speech. We never had that, and, and I think it's one of the best things that we have in the country. People can say what they want. You know, presidents get insulted, ministers get insulted. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but there's a lot that is going on here, which in the, if, if, if it happened in some of the neighboring countries, we may not hear much about you. So our democracy is very, very strong. I, I think that's important. Government responds. I mean, one of the things that have been very saddening for me to watch was the deterioration of the ANC since 1994 in terms of responsiveness to people and accountability. Almost a party beginning to feel that running the country is its birthright. And a radical transformation in the ANC happens when they lost the metros. Mm. South African voters said, we have power, we put you there, and we will remove you. And the mood in the ANC is very, very different than it was before the metros. So I'm making this point less about the ANC and more about the fact that there are three things, we, several things we need to watch, but one of them I want, to em I want to emphasize three now. Watch the behavior of South African voters. <laughs> they don't vote like cows. Others do. They may not vote for the opposition, but they will say, I will not vote for my party because it's not doing what it is doing. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in Swani, in Houteng, and in PE. Where ANC voters said, we have had enough. You are not listening to us. And the ANC started listening. The second thing you should watch is the media. The media in South Africa is not perfect, but it's amongst the best in the world. Very courageous. They get it wrong sometimes, but they keep the politicians in check. They keep, the, I think they need to do more in terms of also doing the same with business. Mm. I think the media tends to think that political power lies only with uh, politicians. Business is a major, major political player. And I think our media can be more probing, but already in there, I'm just saying with all those limitations, I would still rank it amongst the best mm. in the world. And the other blessing we have in this country is the judiciary. <laughs> our judges are excellent. They are courageous. They are not there to be pushed around. The areas where we are very weak are in the police and in the prosecution. Mm. We are still very weak, and we hope that there will be a major change in the prosecution because the judges come at the end of the process. Yeah. It starts with police, and then it comes but to prosecutors. And if you are not right there... Well, let me go back then to the practicalities of running a state <laughs> and what I may call the political culture in South Africa where political parties promise free things. They are called free. Uh, the ANC is guilty of that, and the EFF is also marching, you know, in the, in the, in the same direction. We have this situation, electricity blackouts, we call them load shedding, which I think softens <laughs> the whole point. <laughs> we don't have electricity, and we call it load shedding. No problem. But at the same time, we are promised free electricity, and in the same breath, the same ESCOM has got its own challenges, including having to raise 
a whole lot of money. Most recent stories that ESCOM needs 100 billion runs in addition to the existing loans. So where is free anything there if we're spending so much money that is debt-based on one hand and then free consumption on the other and tariffs that are going up on the other hand? Can you help me make sense of that? Yeah. <laughs> Tim, I wish you didn't ask me that question because yeah. my first answer will be to moderate something I've said earlier. You remember I told you how the voters brought the ANC in line. Yeah. That's the virtue of voting. Let me tell you the vice of voting. You cannot have, in an election, you cannot win unless you promise people heaven and earth. Yes. You can't win if you say, you know, this is my plan and please vote for me. And you're going to pay for it. You know, cut out social grants, no more social yeah. grants, no more salary increases, no more free housing. Nobody's going to vote for you. The electoral system is such that it produces people who say things they know they will not fulfill. I think that... And that applies all over. You know, the irony is <laughs> the only politician I know who is doing what he said he was going to do, ironically, is Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, everybody else, ducks and yes. drive. And Donald Trump is just pushing with his According right According to the like, promises he made. He yeah. made, yeah. 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 I'm just saying it's very funny that he's the only one who is doing that. So that's the first kind of theoretical problem you have. The second one is coming from our history. It is, not inconceiv it is not inconceivable that the government will try to do whatever it can for poor people. You know, it's difficult to look at poor people and say, tough luck. I don't think our problem is giving things free. I can come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Our problem is the minute you have to give people things free, is because they are unemployed. Yes. The only reason you give social grants is people are unemployed. And those things reflect something, that your economic policies have failed. <laughs> that you are not, your economy is not growing, it's not producing jobs. One of the most interesting things that President Cyril Ramaphosa seems to be pursuing relentlessly is repairing the economy. Because unless people are, an, are unemployed, you either have to give them something free or they will take it themselves. Yes, yeah. It is as simple as that. So it's a case of trying to keep people at bay. At bay. In the, in the meantime, but yeah. the only way to keep people at bay is to get your economy functioning. That, it is as simple as that. And South African economy is dysfunctional, has not been performing. And sometimes we are still caught up in the old language of the Cold War. We are not living in the modern world. But it's not going to get right now. U.S. unemployment is what gave Trump the votes that he got. But the economy today is not producing jobs, and we need to be creative then. But here, here is now, I mean, the, the, in the South African situation, the unemployment rate is as high as ever and it does not seem like it's going to come down anytime soon mm -hmm. yet uh, money must be found for additional things for instance free tertiary education is one of them at the same time we've got a problem in basic education mm -hmm. which from the experts i gather it's because we have a very weak uh, system when it comes to early childhood learning and there's no talk about money being made available there. How do you balance free tertiary education at the end of the whole story um, in relation to a poor basic education system which actually does not even provide as much resources or money for early childhood learning? You are not going to balance it. It will catch up with you. You don't have to do anything, it will catch up with you. You must, uh, do you remember the old South African Airways advert? I hope I'm not advertising it now. No, 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 go Fly ahead. Fly now, yeah. pay later. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what we are doing. Yes. 
and it will crash. Right now, we, are, we have reached a crunch. Certain things have to be given up. <laughs> it is as simple as that. We will need to learn to prioritize. And ironically, education and health don't need more money. They just need people who do what they are supposed to be doing. <laughs> In terms of com countries at our level, we are way above budget in terms of education mm. and health, mm. but the return on our, on our investment is minimal. So we need to, it's not about money in South Africa, it's not about more resources, it's going to be more about more resourcefulness. And we have just been spending, when your credit card stops with one bank, you go to another bank to apply for a credit card, but you reach a dead trap, and I think we are on our way there. So, in a, which then is, in itself is a threat to the sustainability of the democratic system. So a very, very serious threat. Now, here we are at this time right. with all the problems that we have. You said earlier that you believe uh, corruption will probably be dealt with and somehow might be reduced as a result of the appointment of the new chief of the National Prosecuting Authority. And, of course, citizens have got a role to play. How do we... And, 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 and those in charge, the politicians and, and those who occupy positions of influence have got a role. How do we then get our, our country right, our nation right, so that we can enjoy some minimal rights and help uplift those that are excluded from the socio-economic system? Tim, the first weapon ordinary people have is their vote. Unfortunately, today, when you look at political parties, what separates them is very little. It's not like you can move from one party to the other. You know, I actually think one reason, I think the ANC will survive the next elections, but I don't think it will survive because it's the most popular, but it will survive because the alternatives don't look particularly attractive. I think, so I think that power is a bit of a blunt instrument. Mm. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing that ordinary people have to do, I actually think, for example, people now need to become active in terms of education of their children. If you know that teachers are not in school on time, much to their homes. <laughs> you know, people have been paralyzed too much waiting for a miracle. Unfortunately, Tim, I was born in an age where you never expected much from governments. Mm. You were always afraid of what they were going to do to you rather than what they can do for you. And I think our view of always having a very statist view of how we progress, it's not going to help us very much. I think communities now begin to be very serious, making that sure that the clinics and the schools work and making noise if the teachers are not there. That's very, very important. Mm. And if the problem is yeah. with the regional office, much to the regional office, well, I think people now need to take over. Proactive citizenry. Absolutely citizenship. proactive. Yeah. And f don't forget, Tim. I have to interrupt you there. I will remember. We can carry on with the conversation, but uh, we benefited a lot from, from uh, your thoughts and ideas. Dr. Vincent Mapai, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.